It's in a ball almost too heavy for a strong man to carry. After it's been cooked and squeezed and put in a bottle, it's perfect for pouring on just about anything. What is it? The nectar of the blue agave. That's up next on Chefs Afield. Agave, just one sweet from Mexico, from the state of Jalisco. Organic fair trade honey, from Quintana Roo is another. Agave is produced in that heavy ball, the piña. The honey, of course, comes from the hives. And a lot of flavors going on here. Just Chef Richard Sandoval uses both in his modern Mexican cuisine. We like to go to the source, get better quality, more interesting. And I mean, obviously, being Mexican, I mean, I, you know, I want to cook with Mexican ingredients. Sandoval learned to cook as a young boy, watching his father in the kitchen of the family restaurant. This is where everything got started, you know, 25 years ago. 25 years ago? Yep. I, I was your age, running around this kitchen, peeling potatoes, carrots. <laughs> He learned the trade and took over the family's establishment, Madeiras, in Acapulco. Now runs a dozen restaurants from San Francisco to New York to Dubai. Modern Mexican restaurants. I think for me it's kind of gone full circle and I think, you know, everybody at some point, you know, you, you go back to where, you, where everything came from. My father was working, I was running around the restaurant and little did I know that my love for the industry was beginning to get implanted in me at that time. Sweet and spicy taste. Again, the And now here comes another Sandoval, 12-year-old chef in the making, the eager and curious Giancarlo. What about your palate? Do you have a good palate? Yeah. Yeah, why? Because I inherited from mommy. <laughs> the blue agave grows only in the state of Jalisco, known world round for two things, the birth of mariachi music and as the only state where tequila, made from the juice of the agave, is distilled. The agave plant grows year round, literally turning the hills around tequila to a subtle and intriguing blue. Why, why did they take this part of Mexico? Because of the altitude? Yes. The soil very good for the agave plant to grow here? Yes, that's right. The altitude and also all the nutrients that the plant can take in this kind of soil. What, and what, what about the sun? I mean, do they need a lot of sun? Is that, uh, it seems like it's very hot up here. Yes, also the dry. <laughs> it's dry. They, they need so. dry weather. Yeah. But what is the name of the plant? Well, this plant is called agave tequilana blue weaver. It's the same plant that you use to make tequila. Are there any any medicinal values from, from the agave plant, or is it just for the tequila? Well, the there's other uh, uses, uh -huh. like the syrup. Okay. It also has digestive properties. Okay. Well, why are they blue? Well, because I, they're blue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just wondering. Yeah, yeah. The blue agave plant, a succulent with spiky, fleshy leaves that can grow six feet or more. Long, spiky leaves, poisonous to predators. The ones we're looking at here, they're, they're obviously organic plants, right? That's right, yes. In fields like this, we don't use any chemicals, uh -huh. uh, fertilizers or additives. Okay. So it's quite natural. The agave plant begins life as a small shoot poking up from the soil. Once it flowers, it requires pollinating done by bats, not bees. Only then does the large fibrous bulb, the piña or pineapple, develop. Do once they plant this then, do they just go by themselves and, that, and that's it? Or do they have to come back and trim them and make sure that... No, they are naturally growing. How do you tell when a plant is ready to be harvested? I mean, they'll look the same to me. Well, it has to pass like from seven to 10 years okay. in order to be harvested. How many can they harvest in... in one day? Yeah. Well, they can almost uh, make a hundred. What are the name of the people who cut the plants? Okay, well, the farmers that actually cut all the leaves are called himadores because all the process of harvesting the agave is called hima. So, if you want, let's talk to them. The himador, caretaker of the agave, with his koa, the traditional tool for cutting. So, what does it look like inside of the, the piña? Do you want to see? Yeah. Let's ask him. Señor, ¿nos puede, por favor, decir cómo? Partir una piña para que la vean. It's hard to cut it. 
Yeah, I mean, it's gotta be, I'm sure it's very sharp in order to. So they're not watery inside? No. Can I touch that? It, it burns, so be careful. The sugar. Concentrate in this part. In this middle part in here. In the center of the peanut. Okay. Would you rather prefer this over sugar cane? Yes, it's better for you. So and it's so also sweeter? It's, it's sweeter, yes. The pina is a stringy mass, bitter. The juice is poisonous until it has been cooked. Like, can we try, like, cutting one of the plants? Que the gimador teach us how to... Sure. Yeah. Alfonso, ¿cómo se llama esto? Es cabo. Cabo? This is, this is called cabo. Uh-huh. At the end, this is called coa. As you can see, it's sharp at, at the end. Looks like, can I touch it? Looks like it's really sharp. Yeah. Wow, be careful. It's, it's almost like a knife. Yes. Wow. So it has to be like really sharp in order to cut all the leaves. Can mm -hmm. we try? Can sure. Uh, you want to see how? Sure. Give it a shot. Como, to... como la I want to cut my toes off though. Oh. Yes, yeah. Be careful Watch with your, your feet. Yeah. Wow, it's pretty good. <laughs> Is it hard? Yeah. <laughs> oh God. I'm gonna put you to make, do some gardening at the house now. <laughs> So first you trim some of the leaves off and then you start hitting the root yes. so you can tip it over and then pick it up and... And cut all of it. Why don't you try? Can I try? Impossible. No, it's, it's not. Hard. It's impossible. Está bien así? Sí. ¿Por qué no se cae? You have to push it. Arribita. Acá? Yeah, you have to put your... Ahí? Sí, y la cruz con el pie. Para que se vaya. <laughs> you almost got it. Ah. A chef for decades, Richard Sandoval is now trying something new and learning firsthand just how much muscle it takes to make the juice. There you go. That's it. That's a hard job. ¿Cuánto tarda en cortar todo? Tres minutos. Oh, it looks like it took me about an hour. <laughs> that's, that's where the name piña comes from, right? It looks like a pineapple. So that's the translation right, yes. piña is like pineapple. Pineapple farm. They have to take every All leaf the off, leaves, right? Yes. Indeed, related to neither the pineapple nor the cactus, the agave is a relative of the lily. Do you know what the final product tastes like? Sure, do you want to try it? Sure. Have right over. Wow, it's very good, actually. It's sweet, isn't it? It's, yeah, it's nice and sweet, but again, it's very neutral. So I, I mean, you can right. use it for almost anything, I think, in yes. cooking. So you can use it on your pancakes? Yes, and it tastes wow, really good. I'll, I'll take this home. Yeah, it's actually very nice. I usually use it for lemonade uh -huh. or coffee. It's a sweetener, but it's neutral. I mean, yes. you're, you're not getting another flavor that you might get some from other sweeteners. You get something else. And it tastes better than regular syrup. Yeah, I mean, you're just getting a, a, sweet, you know, yeah. a sweet taste to it. Mm -hmm. wow, good, good sugar, yeah. healthy sugar. Nectar that metabolizes slowly in the human body. Yeah. Let's try this. Why is this one lighter in color? Because mm. it was filtered more wow. time. It's very good. So this it came from the same plant though, right? That's right. This has been purified, pasteurized, been cooked longer? Or? The temperature, uh -huh. it's been a little higher when they cook it. Well, that's a, that's a great flavor. And obviously if it's organic, there's no additives. It's from the field to the plant. That's right. I want to drink the bottle. <laughs> Sweet natural nectar, twice as sweet as cane, and long believed to have healing qualities. Oh, so from one piña, how many bottles of syrup could it produce? It depends on the sugar that it concentrates on the piña. Oh, so. You know how sometimes when you, when you eat a pineapple, sometimes they're sweet, sometimes they're not sweet? Yeah. It's so the same it, thing It's the same here. thing, so it, just, it, it varies. So then I'm just going to load these all into the trucks? From here they go into the truck and then into the plant and then... Do, do they carry them because like, yeah. it burns your hands? It's not an easy job. No, I mean, it's hot. No, it's, and it burns. Right. Yeah, no, I mean, they definitely have a, they do a great job at what they do. And I know. Yeah. Respectable. Thank you very much, Carla, for the tour. It was my pleasure. Did you learn something, Giancarlo? It's hard work. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> now to extract the sweetness, the piles of piñas taken away, the heart of the plant cooked low and slow, 160 degrees for a whole day. Only then are the piñas removed from the oven. Crushed and milled, the juice filtered and bottled. Nothing added. Purely organic, purely sweet. Up close, the buzz becomes a roar. 40,000, 60,000, perhaps 80,000 creatures bringing in nectar, beating their wings to keep it dry, storing it, making the nectar into honey. A busy, well-organized factory operating 24 hours a day with inventory control, security, and personnel specialization. 
we're in the state of Quintana Roo in Mexico. Uh, we're very close to the town of uh, Carrillo Puerto. The people these bees are working for are Mexicans of Mayan descent. We're in the Yucatan Peninsula, famous for tourism and the ruins of Mayan cities a thousand years old. The ancient Mayas actually had, you know, a bee activity uh, as part of, you know, their economy. So these people have been in the business for centuries. The hives are placed deep in the jungle, tended by beekeepers who live nearby. The gentleman has been uh, a beekeeper for 30 years. He started out with five, uh, five hives and has grown to 80, to 80 hives and four hype sites. Mark these as fair trade certified, organic. Those are hardly labels that their ancestors used. Fair trade implies a way in which producers can get fair amount of money for their work. The fair trade certification means these beekeepers work as a cooperative. They are paid a fair market wage. So he's using the tools to extract one of the boards. As you can see, each board is formed with wax, and inside the wax you find the honey. The honeybee, Apis mellifera, flies no more than a mile and a half. The most important thing in order to have organic production of honey is that it has to be on a radius that uh, is not uh, infected uh, by any type of contamination or uh, outside uh, pollutants. Uh, that means that at least uh, from this side towards uh, the nearest road, you find uh, two to three miles. So, a zone of organic growth has been established around these hives. Thus, for the first time, U.S. authorities and other organizations around the world can certify that this honey made by bees is indeed organic. Being organic for uh, this type of cups and a small producer represents at least a 20 to 30 percent increase in the price that they can get in the market. So it's a big difference. The females are the worker bees. They fly out to the flowers, bring back the nectar, make the honey. We're just checking the amount of honey that uh, is inside uh, each plate. The nectar, the honey, feeds the hive, protein to feed the young worker bees. But busy bees produce more than they need. Good news for the humans. In her lifetime, one worker bee will produce one teaspoon of honey. It takes more than 500 worker bees to produce a pound of honey. To do that, they flew some 35,000 one-mile trips. The boards full of honey are extracted temporarily from the hive. The work is done quickly, lest the bees decide to reclaim the honey. We're going to take off the top of the wax, and all this liquid is going to be afterwards separated in that cylinder. The final product, pure honey, nothing more. Grade A, organic, fair trade certified. They will filter it and take it back to the facility and then refilter that in order to assure quality and clarity. We just spoon in here and see what kind of... Uh... Pretty soon it's in somebody's kitchen. Wow. The first one we're going to be making today is going to be a salmon terrine. You know, using some of the agave syrup that we saw how you know, it was made yesterday in the farms. It's organic. And actually we're here at Madeiras where I got started 25 years ago. So 25 years ago I was standing where you were. Can you believe that? <laughs> All right, so we're going to be making our, our salmon terrine. We're going to be doing it in, in two, two different steps. We're going to be doing our uh, vinaigrette, which is a chile guajillo, and then we're going to be making our salmon tartare, which is the salmon that we've cured overnight with a little bit of uh, olive oil, a little bit of chili oil, some cilantro, some chives, a little bit of mint, a little bit of preserved lemon, some jicama, and some avocado, and some cucumber. Mm -hmm. So why don't we get started first with our vinaigrette. Okay. So we have a little bit of uh, vinegar, a little bit of olive oil. You can start mixing it if you want as, as I'm you know, throwing this stuff in. A little bit of our guajillo oil. It's a chile guajillo puree with a little bit of canola oil. We're gonna add a little bit of lemon juice. And then a little bit of salt. And so here we're gonna add to the vinaigrette your agave syrup, which is what you know we saw in the field, yeah. how they, you know, it's the organic agave and it's baked and then you, know, you saw the whole process. And that's what what's going to do, it's going to balance it out. You know, you, you have acid. Because it doesn't have an aftertaste like honey or... Ex ex exactly. I mean, you, 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 want, you want to have some that, that, that's going to just show up your, your guajillo, your acid, and this will just balance it to make sure it's not too spicy and or too acidy. Yeah. Yeah, you taste it? Taste that. Wow. 
That's very nice. I know. Great, great job. You saw the hard work that went into these guys, you know, I mean, I know. From, from, you know, the, the jimador cutting the, the piña, you know, from there carrying it onto the ovens, yeah. and then, you know, going through the whole, the whole process. And now we'll start making our terrine. So what we want to do is mix a little bit of our jicama. It's a root vegetable. You know, it has a high water content, not very much flavor. It's, kind of, it's, it's neutral. So it's good, you know, for, for things when you don't want to have a lot of flavor, but just, you know, kind of get a little texture, you know, nice water content. We're going to add a little bit of our avocado. So grab a couple of spoonfuls of that. We're going to add a little bit of local mango. You know, Acapulco is known for its, uh, for its mangoes here. And a lot of times if you buy them in the States, you'll see, you know, it says made, you know, grown in Mexico. You know, you get a lot of tropical fruits here. Preserved lemon. It's lemon peel. Preserve it in oil, some spices, a little bit of vinegar, fresh cilantro, a little bit of chive, and a little bit of mint. Okay, we can put that down. And now we're gonna do our salmon here that after, you know, we kind of cured a little bit, you know, marinated in a little bit of oil, olive oil, some chili oil overnight, just so it has more flavor to it. Because mm -hmm. I'm just gonna cut it into small cubes. That's a cube to you? No, well, I'm yeah. not finished yet. <laughs> so like little dices. Yeah, little dices, exactly. Are you gonna cook it or? You know, it's not actually cooked in heat, but it's preserved with the oils and, and the herbs. Because oh, yeah. now what you want to do is grab a couple spoonfuls of, of our jicama mango and put them in here. Grab some of the salmon and cover that. It's just, it's almost like a salmon tartare, so you know, it's already been cleaned, you know, no skin. Okay, now what we want to do is, you know, compress this a little bit and then add a couple more spoonfuls of that in here. See what you're gonna do, you're gonna get all these layers yeah. of flavor. So when you bite into it, you know, you're gonna get your, your chile guajillo vinaigrette, your avocado, your mango, your jicama, Meat. and then we'll finish it off with our salmon. And again, you want to make sure you compress it to, with your hand or your spoon. So now what we're going to do is we're going to get our plate, grab the cucumber, and this, this cucumber, you know, we've marinated a little bit of um, rice vinegar. So we get a little bit of acid and a little bit of sweetness going on in here. Grab one and just start going, going around like this. Beautiful. I want to make a circle, so make it oh, you know, a little bit wider. This is our canvas here. These are all our paints, yeah. flavors, and textures. And we're, we're creating a painting of flavors and textures. Now you want to grab your tureen. So grab it, make sure you grab the, the paper underneath so it doesn't all fall up. Put your hand underneath, like that. And now here, and then put it on here. Now we're just going to drag it on here. Now you, gra how do you grab your spoon take it out? And, and just you know, make sure you push the stuff in and then you pull that out. Wow, see? Dogs are super good. <laughs> Let's just finish it up. Let's grab a little bit of our, the vinaigrette you made with your guajillo, your agave syrup, mm -hmm. and your lemon juice. Drizzle it around. Get close to it. Let's go all the way around. Beautiful. And then we can just finish it up. Just grab some chives and just you know throw them on there. You know, it'll give it you know, an extra little. There you go. Your salmon terrine. You want to try it now? See, we'll see you. Uh, sure. When you taste it, I mean. Does it excite your palate? It tastes all the flavors going on, the textures, yeah. the, the heat, the spicy, the sweet. That's, it's really good. You yeah, taste well, everything. Well, that's what it's all about. I mean, someone tastes it and say, well, Giancarlo made this, you know, and he, he, he put the right flavors in it. There's heat, there's sweet, you know, there's, there's, everything is going on. I think that's the most important thing. Wow. Great job. It's good. We're going to be making now, Giancarlo, we're going to be doing Camarones a la Veracruzana. Mm -hmm. Again, it's a, a very traditional dish from the Veracruz re region of Mexico. But before we get started, let me put our, our saute pans to get start getting heated up. Well, while you do that, do you put um, butter on it or something? Or? No, we'll just heat them up and then we'll put our oil in. We just okay. want to make we have a nice you know, hot pan before we start cooking. Okay. Shrimp, tail on, you know, deveined. How do they devein? Oh, so you, yeah, you, yeah. You, you yeah, just yeah, you know, yeah, cut them yeah. here and then you take out yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the little uh, vein right there. We're going to do a little tomato uh, puree. Tomato puree. A little bit of tequila. Remember the jimador with the agave? Yeah. We're going to be using the amber honey. And the reason we're using amber honey on this dish is because we're, we're going to be heating it up. So, you know, we want it to dissolve right away. So why would we use the honey instead of the agave? Because the, the agave, as you saw, our other dishes were a little more delicate. Yeah. So we didn't, have, we didn't want to have any flavor to it. Okay. So the agave is, is simpler, but it's still giving you that sweetness and that okay. uh, balancing effect. But here, it's a heavier dish with a lot heavier flavor, so you don't mind using a Different honey thing. that has, that has okay. you know, more flavor. A little bit of uh, purple onion, a little bit of garlic, some serranos. You mm -hmm. know, obviously, yes. if you don't want it so spicy, you can use yeah. a jalapeno, you, you, know, you, you know that. A little calamata olives, a little bit of cilantro, red bell peppers. Do our shrimps first. 
So do we take off the tail or just leave no, it No, we'll cook them on with the tail on. What okay. we'll do is we'll add a little bit of our canola oil. Again, you want to use a simple oil because you don't want to add any flavor. So you're not going to use yeah. olive oil because, you know, there's, there's no, that doesn't really make sense. So grab your shrimp right here and season them real quick. And what? A little bit of salt. It's one of the most important things in cooking is to season all your, all your proteins. So now we're going to put them in here. You know, be careful. Throw them away from you. Why do you keep the tails on? I mean, for, for two reasons. I mean, you know, one of the reasons is for look, so you can stand them up on the plate. And the other reason, you know, a, a lot of the shells have a lot of the flavor from the shrimp. So yeah. while you're cooking them, a lot of the flavor will stay in here, which you want to have in your sauce. Okay, now we're going to start doing our sauce here. You want to add, add a little bit of oil. Yeah. See how it's smoking hot? Now add a little bit of our garlic. Toss it all in. Now do our onions. And we just want to cook this, you know, to, to, to the translucent. That looks good by itself. See all the nice flavors you're getting yeah. out of the pan? Okay, now let's add our, I mean, our, our serranos, our serrano chilies. Since just, I don't like it that spicy, then you should just put it. Yeah, so then put less. Like that's good? Our uh, black olives. Do you like black olives or no? Yeah. Okay, then add them all. Okay. Let's add our, our bell peppers. And then we're going to toss this around. Okay. This is what separates the, the boys from the men, actually cooking with fire. And you just toss your stuff around. Let me add a tomato puree. Toss everything around real quick. Now we're gonna add a little bit of lemon juice. You get you know, some nice acidity to it. Mix it around. I'm gonna add a little bit of the amber honey to get a little bit of sweetness. And then you have your Veracruz sauce. Now we're gonna flambe our shrimp. So we're gonna grab our tequila here. So wa watch out, yeah, you're gonna get fire. And it's gonna evaporate, see? And if you just blow on it, it just goes off. But see, so what's gonna happen here is we're going to get this really nice agave flavor, but none of the alcohol. So I'm going to toss the shrimp in here, some of the agave and, and some of the juices from the shrimp, which you want in your sauce. I'll just put them around the plate. That looks pretty good. And it tastes even better. And then we just want to get, you know, our, our bell peppers, our black olives. Basically what you have here is just, you know, some chives, you know, pureed in a, in a blender with a little bit of canola oil. And again, it's just, you know, for color, and maybe a, a little bit of flavor. Put it on the edge right here. No, you can just drizzle it all the way around. Now finish it off with a little bit of fresh cilantro. And the reason I'm doing the fresh cilantro at the end is because I, I, I want to get a, a nice fresh flavor. If I would have put the cilantro into the sauce, yeah. you're going to cook it and it's going to get a different flavor. Yeah. You want a nice, you know, fresh flavor at the end. Voila. There you go. Camarones a la Veracruzana or shrimp Veracruz style. How is it? You pass the test? Wow. Tastes really good. Yeah? Well, what, what, you see, do you taste all the flavors? You taste the garlic, pepper. I taste like lots of the pepper. With some nice cilantro at the end. It sort of has like a sweet and spicy taste. Again, the contrast in flavors. That's what it's all about. It's all about the textures, balances, contrast. Yeah. And when, you know, whoever you're cooking for, they taste something, you're gonna get this wonderful flavors, you know, playing off in their tongue, which mm. I think is the key to, to a great dish. It's good.